Hi everybody, welcome to Shouting from the Sidelines. You are joined by me, Luke, and Nick from Foot Tech today, and delighted to have Andy Barker with us. Um, Andy's going to introduce himself in a second, but Andy is a, is a physio, a consultant physio, who's worked at the elite level of sport, in particular in rugby league. Um, currently consultant physio for the FA, working with their international teams at under 15 to under 20 level, men's and, and women's. Um, so he's got some great experiences to share with us, as well as talking about um, injury prevention for children and just some of his experiences, really, which will be really interesting. Andy, thank you for coming on. Um, and can, can you just introduce yourself a little bit, Andy, just further to what I've said? Uh, yeah, firstly, thanks for, thanks for having me on, Luke. Um, yeah, so I'm a physio, physio by trade. Uh, went a long way around sort of getting into the, uh, into the sort of profession, really. So grew up enjoying sport, football and rugby. Probably realised quite early I wasn't going to be uh, any good or good enough anyway to, uh, to make a career out of myself. Um, but I uh, obviously really like sport. And I think probably the day I realised you could... I guess working sport worked really closely with the players. Um, I was really interested in about how the human body works. So once I sort of pieced those two things together, I sort of uh, went down that sort of route really. So I studied uh, physiotherapy and then I was very lucky to get a job straight from university. So it was off the back of a like student placement as part of my studies at the Leeds Rhinos. Uh, and then I spent sort of 10 seasons there. So a couple of years as like the assistant physio and then eight years as the first team physio at the Leeds Rhinos. And, it sort of, a, I was there at a time when um, they had some really good success so between sort of 2009 and, and 2018. So it's almost like the golden mm. golden decade, really, which was obviously a really good, good good time to be there. And then sort of since then, since having a sort of family, um, just wanted to sort of move and transition out of full-time sport. It's it's good. And there's probably all the good points that way, all the bad points, but it is very time-consuming, a lot of unsociable hours. And obviously having two two young kids now myself, I want to spend a bit more time with them. So... I've transitioned now, still work in sport and do some consultancy work, like I say, at the, at the FA, which is really good. I really enjoy it. It's been a big change. I also do some more consultancy work, still within rugby, rugby union, rugby league, and also spend my time, rest of my days, really working in my, my clinic in Leeds. Brilliant. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Rhinos um, later on because I think you've been quite modest there. I think it was probably their best their best ever period, wasn't it? When you joined in the the success they had was was fantastic. So yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in a in a second. Um, so we wanted to get you on, like we say, because I think for, you could talk about experiences at elite level sport, but obviously now you can also talk about uh, as a physio the things that you see in, in children from a movement perspective and injury prevention perspective and so forth. Um, you played sport as well, Andy. Uh, you played at a good level of, of, of rugby, so you know you know you know what it takes to to get to that next stage. I think you've seen the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. Um, what what I wanted to kick off with is to is to ask you really the main differences that you've seen with regards to that. So, so the differences that you see in the players that ended up going into elite level rugby league to those that maybe didn't academy level and, and weren't quite there. And then obviously from a football perspective as well and, and what you're seeing now. Yeah, I think, I think there's probably more similarities than natural differences, really, if you were going to compare, say, my time in rugby and, and what I've seen already in, in sort of football. So I think if you're using that maybe transition from academy to a first team level, whether that's football, rugby or, or any other sort of sport, you could sort of apply that to, um, I think more of it comes down to um, probably their mentality. So in terms of how how kids at that age, because they are, they are still kids and they're talking 16, 17, 18, um, sort of uh, apply, their, apply themselves. And it's probably no coincidence that at that probably time in life, there's all of the, I guess, distractions that can come about in terms of like socialising, you know, going out on the tiles with, with the friends, doing other things. Um, I think there's obviously so many more distractions now for people's time um, than probably when we were that age, even in terms of like social media and Netflix and things like that. Just um, everything's obviously built um, and all these companies know how to, to draw people's attention away from, from other things. So to try and keep focused on, I guess, whatever that is, whether that's, you know, wanting to be a professional footballer or rugby player is probably even more difficult than, than it ever was really. But the, for the guys that I've seen probably progress, probably at, the, at that level, or probably in terms of physical ability or, or skill level, uh, probably not, not too dissimilar, but the ones that push on are, are probably those that that probably do make those sort of, sort of sacrifices at, at that sort of age. And, and some of the sacrifices as well are not not so much just on maybe 
on the players themselves, particularly at that age, if they're not driving and there's a lot of sacrifices from parents mm. um, that you see sometimes. And some people are more fortunate than other people in terms of they've got really supportive parents and people around them to, to help them out. And obviously other people have not maybe quite got that support, which I guess makes that a little bit more difficult. But you will always get exceptions to the rule. So you will get those those sort of freaks who who are um, are really good at what, what their space sport they do and not necessarily have the, the best work ethic. Uh, but we'll still make it to that level, but they're sort of few and few and far between. And um, I guess, yeah, having, I guess, that great mentality, really. And I guess, I, going back, if I compare sport, probably time when I first started in rugby to now, even, I think there's a there's a bit of a change as well in almost the, the mentality of, of young people. And, and I see this as well, not just in sport, but even from, like, student and soon to be qualified therapist there's almost like a bit more of an entitlement yeah. and whether that's a side to title thing or what where the sort of qualify um you know therapist and i went straight to sport from um from university but i worked so hard at uni and i was and i did i got basically given an opportunity when i was still studying and every day i wasn't in uni or I wasn't working for my old man on a building site i was down at the club just not getting paid and obviously that led to obviously a a job whereas a lot of students now um given opportunities like that don't take them for whatever reason because they're too i don't know engrossed in other things that are going on and i don't know what, why i don't even really know the real answer to why that's happening but it obviously cuts a lot of uh opportunities off for young people which is i guess a bit unfortunate definitely i think um that entitlement thing is uh, is interesting and it's something that i think is is creeping into society more and more. Um, and I think it's a trickle down effect. You look at, you know, sort of our maybe grandparents, great grandparents, the stuff that they went through. And then as time's gone on, we've been given <clears throat> more and more as a society. And I think now with children, they, they're given all this stuff and have all this distraction. And it is starting to take a, to have a bit of an impact, really, that entitlement mentality to the point where we get, you know, we get people come to us and within a couple of weeks, it's all, oh, you know, can you can you get them a trial? Can you get them this? Can you get them that? And you think well, they've not they've not worked hard enough. They're not they're not near that that level yet. They've got to go and work. But everybody wants everything yesterday, and are not prepared to work from the bottom, are they? To to to, to get to that top level, and and speaking of that top level, Andy, like we said earlier, you you have you worked in arguably you know the the best the best rugby league side. Um, certainly of our generation and, and will go down as one of the best ever. You've seen the dedication um, with players like Kevin Sinfield and Jamie Jones Buchanan. I mean, we could go on and on and on. What, what do you think, how, how did they set the standards, those players, Andy? How did they conduct themselves and, you know, that level of dedication? What did it look like? So, exactly what you just said there, the, the, the players like set the standards almost. So, the, they were um, a really close knit group. Obviously, it's well known that a lot of them came through the, the sort of academy system, and a lot of them came through around a similar time. So when they when they sort of first started playing first team rugby at the club, the, the still Leeds was still a good team, but they were second best to Wigan and a couple of a couple of other clubs at the time. And all these young players um, were sort of given their given their opportunity at the time. Um, which again, going back to that sort of period and era, a lot of big clubs were would be spending loads of cash on players from the NRL in Australia and internationals there on, on, on big, big money. Uh, the exchange rate then was a bit daft. So like players had come over and could earn a lot of money over here, but players were coming over at the back end of their careers to earn a few quid in Super League as opposed to, you know, being in the, probably their, their prime, which was obviously stunting the opportunities for younger players. But a lot of those guys were given uh, a chance early and they didn't win anything for a few, few, for a few sort of seasons, but they won the first title, I think in 2004, which, was Leeds' first title for like 30 odd years at the time and that was the same team that pretty much stayed there for the next sort of 10, 10 years really so I think that consistency in like playing group and there was obviously not a lot of changes uh, staff wise really as well that's you know uh, I obviously didn't start till working there till 2010 but even before then there was a really quite consistent group not a lot of changes and I think that a bit of credit to like the, the sort of board and the club who sort of stuck by coaches when things weren't going well at certain times and and some of the staff so um, but I think again the, the players drove the sort of culture and made each other accountable uh, were really professional so if you you mentioned like Kevin Sinfield there he, he's without question the most professional 
like athlete I, I've ever seen and worked with. Just uh, everything he did. Bear in mind, he was travelling. It's not particularly that far, but like 45 minutes from Oldham to Leeds every day. He'd be like the first in the training ground, the last one to leave. Um, very similar. More recently, he's, he's in the left the club now, but Callum Watkins, who obviously again, who obviously was recent captain as well for uh, for Leeds, he, he was exactly the same. Um, you know, so I think they, they just made each other accountable, and they had a group of players. I think they just again, a lot of them were local lads, a lot of them come through the system, wanted to be there, and. Uh, and in a, in a salary cap sport, the, all those players, because they were obviously awesome players, were at the club and were probably getting less money than they could probably have got money at, at any other club. Right. But they probably took took a little bit less cash because they knew they were going to win trophies because they had the best team. Mm. You know, and we and that and that you know there were some teams on on paper who were probably probably close to to Leeds, but probably not as they'd not been together as long. They probably didn't have that. Um, I guess that. That connected connectivity that those players sort of had, and and ultimately, like you know, they could probably earn a bit less on their salary, you know. But we know have, have all these experiences of being in big finals and winning games, and, and obviously, when they win trophies, you usually get a bonus as well. So the salary is probably equal to what it would have been, you know, playing at a middle of the middle of the table club. But you know, that's that's that again. That's part of the reason probably why they were, they were so successful. Mm. And and then you talk there about Kevin Sinfield first on, last off. It just seems to be a common theme whenever we speak to people in sport that have worked at that that high level. That even the best players, they they just they work so hard and continuously work hard as well. Um, it's just, there's just no secret to it, is there? It's it just just can't just work and work and work. No, no, it's 100. percent And then particularly in sport, you know, sports, you know, depending on where you're working and particular football's been. Football's a bit like that, not necessarily in my experience, but talking about these like one percent things and players getting like cryo chambers in their houses and all these little bits and pieces. But you know, all that second secondary to all the to doing all the simple things really well, just like eating well, sleeping well, and doing things consistently well. You know, mm. not to say you know some of those best players I've ever worked with, whether it's at the Rhinos or in other sports, you know, don't enjoy having a beer or having McDonald's now and again. You know, that's 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 cool, but. They don't do that every day of the week. They don't do that consistently or every weekend. It's, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a treat if you like after a game or something or something like that. But I think it's just doing the consistent things, you know, well over and over again. And obviously, it pays it pays well in the in the long term. And, and particularly in sport, you know, I think players. It, it, it depends on the individual circumstances, but you'll see some players who have maybe uh, injuries early in the career. Um, particularly, obviously, working as a physio, and, and you'll see it almost like scares them a little bit. So they'll be like, you know, I, I could have, that injury could have been the end of, of me. And for some players it is, if it happens at the, you know, unfortunately at the wrong time, sometimes with contracts and things like that. But they, they sort of had that experience and it's like, you know, I, I want to look after myself in the mm. best way that I can. So control everything that I can. You know, there's some things you can't control. You, you play football and down the wing and someone, you know, comes in bad challenge and, you know, you, you get an you get injury out for a, a season or whatever. You know, there's not much you can do about that, but you can control a lot of your things that, I guess, that go on um, outside of outside of that environment. You you mentioned as well um, the the fitness thing earlier. The, the, that seems to crop up a lot as well when you're talking there about things you can control. You can control how how much you go out for a run, how hard you work in a gym, and things like that. And I think um, we we're saying off air. I think it was something I listened to about Jamie Jones Buchanan, who was recently retired, who. I think he ran to training, didn't he? I think he ran to training, trained, ran home. And you're talking about a guy that um, was still playing higher level rugby league at an, at an older age, uh, a game that's physically demanding. Because of how hard he worked, it meant his career was just so long. And do, do you think that plays, do you think that sets some of them apart as well? The fact that they are just fitter because they've worked harder? Yeah, 100%. And Jamie Jones is a, like a prime example of that. And he, I'm not speaking out of turn, he, he would say, that he's not the best rugby player. He's, you know, he's made a career out of working really hard, uh, and he's spoken like, in the media and stuff in the past that he's um, his best mates with like Kev, it's Kev Sinfield we spoke about before, and he, and he used to say he basically coming up and growing up, he was like, "This kid's really good." He used to play against each other. Kev's from Lancashire, he's from Yorkshire, you know, played against each other all the like county level stuff, and he was like, then started playing together for like England and etc. with in like the youth, and then both signed up obviously signed at Leeds and played together there. And he was like, he's really good. And then 
even at a young age, I think Kev had those sort of attributes and was very professional about what he did. And, and Jones is used to say, I used to hang on his like coattails and whatever he did, I used to do the same. And right. even, even the back end of the career, like the last couple of seasons, uh, they both played together. Kev retired in 2015. Uh, after the one treble, but that like they'd be two players who were like after a, a session outside and pretty tough, they'd they'd go in the gym and they'd both be sat on like a, a rowing machine doing like 10, 10 200 meter intervals under forty seconds. So like that that'd be them. Uh, and then like you're saying about Jones, he sometimes it was um it was it was quite hard work because he uh you like say he would like run to training when his ankle were a bit sore and you're like Jones you're like, not helping yourself out here really you know what I mean <laughs> but, he's, uh, but that but that's again that's Again, some, sometimes he probably did a bit too much mm. to, his de- to his detriment. But, but then again, if he took that away from him, he probably wouldn't have made the career that he did. He wouldn't have been one of the trophies that he did. And uh, Yeah, so you, you actually, I guess you sort of have to try and uh, tame some of that sometimes. But yeah, obviously you don't want to tame it too much because that's all like one of his, probably, probably his best attribute. Um, what are some of the risks, Andy? I was, I was wondering, as you were describing that, that sort of sprang to mind. Is, is there a danger of having to manage workload with some of these players who are utterly obsessed and wanting to train all day every way? I'm thinking of some younger kids listening and maybe getting the idea of running to and from school every day. It, it, it just are there any risks for young people yeah. as well? Yeah, I think I think there's for there's obviously in relation to everything, everything you do. There's there's probably a, a fine line between obviously pushing yourself and doing a bit, doing things to get better, whether that's physicality or, or whatever, but, and then obviously doing too much. And that's ultimately where, where kids or, or adults will get injured. And I guess it's uh, it's a bit easier in a, in a sort of, I guess a full-time sports environment because pretty much, you know, everything that, you know, training that they do, that the players do is sort of led by staff and it's obviously all programmed and it's all, all fits into like a, a big, a big sort of picture. So the way like a, I guess a, a season's designed is from start to finish and there'll be weeks where the, the, the plan to train harder than others and there'll be big games coming up where they might taper down a little bit. And again, that's more difficult when you're not in those environments because if you're leading a lot of your, I guess, training, running things yourself. But um, even at a younger age, you, you probably know, um, you feel like you can run run for like days and days and days, don't you? But um, some of it's sometimes not necessarily doing more. It's just probably been... Um, a bit smarter with what you're doing, so necessarily going out for a run every day. You know, will you get fitter? Yes, but that might not necessarily make you a better rugby player or a better footballer. Um, it's just again, and, and in cases like that, it's probably getting some advice and some guidance as to exactly what you what you were doing. Um, again, it, it, there's a big difference there between like adults and and sort of kids uh, about again the type of things that you maybe should should be doing. And on that, in terms of thinking about injuries in particular, I don't know if we've been uh, just lucky touch wood, but in five years or so, in terms of things like soft tissue injuries, pulled muscle, or pulled a hamstring, okay, we haven't. Um, what are the differences between children and then, I don't know, our oldest kids are about 12, so at what age would you say that there's maybe a change in terms of how they need to look after themselves physically? Um, yeah, so a lot of... I guess a lot of the like youth, I guess call it youth based injuries usually happen from probably like early teens and then, then onwards and a lot of them like growth related. Um, so I'm probably not telling you something that you don't know, but as obviously as you, um, as you grow, like your bones are not fully fused together, hence why you, obviously your bones get longer and you get taller, etc. cetera. Um, and because of that, you get certain conditions that are pretty much specific to, to children. So you can get injuries around like the knees and hips, which, uh, and not necessarily due to to overuse or doing too much of an activity, um, but I guess uh, more related to their their growing and around puberty. There is cases in terms of like activity doing sometimes too much activity around certain times of growth, so they'll get like growth spurts. And if they're heavily, you know, playing football at school, playing rugby one night, cricket, going for a run one night, doing all this sort of stuff at times like that, um, sometimes they can come into a little bit of trouble. But usually, it's just a case of I don't know, taking a few days or slowing down what they're doing for a week or two and then they're generally okay. Kids tend to be quite robust in terms of and quite resilient. Um, and and in terms of the type of injuries that you get, they generally tend to be those specific like um, children's type injuries. So you might have heard of conditions like Oshkod Slatters. Um, yeah. yeah, and things like that. They're really they're sort of common. Um, but And they are linked to activity. So people, kids who are generally more active and more like to get them. But then on the flip side, 
um, being obviously being active and being healthy has got obviously other great health benefits. So it's a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a trade off between the two yeah. things. We, we've been looking at a lot uh, around uh, that in a similar way in terms of skill development and the benefits from doing not just football and, and a variety of different sports because of the, of the benefits there skill wise. In terms of uh, just more from a physical point of view and, and slightly injury, are there benefits from multi-sport in your opinion for, for children to be doing? Yeah, 100%. And you see, you probably see that in, I guess, even in adult athletes, some of the best um, athletes that I've worked with have, were like those, you know, they've heard of players who, again, made a career in football or rugby, but at probably at 16, 17, had a, like a contract offer from cricket to cricket or, or things like that. And uh, it's generally those, I guess, kids who've, I guess, had that, um, exposure so it doesn't have to mean they have to play rugby Monday football Tuesday cricket Wednesday you know they might have a passion for one particular sport and that's obviously great um, but I think coaches and I guess that's parents as well I guess who have an understanding that other sports particularly when they're younger uh, can be really beneficial in terms of just moving what, what the body really loves is like variability so if you're doing the same thing over and over again like so many people now we're recording this out in, in lockdown so many people now are spending working from home and having like back pain because they're probably sat in a chair all day in the kitchen table or office or whatever else. It's because the, the body's not getting up, walking around the office or going for the lunch or whatever. Uh, and the body just being conditioned to being do one thing, whereas the body's not really built to do that. And I think the more exposure that we get to other things, and that might be just be in a football session doing like playing rugby as part of your warm up, as daft as that sounds. Um, you know, and it's going to have a lot of carryover, and, and kids enjoy it as well, don't they? So, yeah. doing things a little bit different. Um, so, I think it's an easy way to, I guess, incorporate different skills, and obviously, it can have, have great benefit as well. You, Andy, have sat in the changing rooms um, at games like the grand final, and and obviously highly charged games in the league and things against the top opponents, and you've seen them win, you've seen them lose, and, and a question question from parents that crops up quite a lot is how how can we help our children deal with failure whether that be uh, at school at sport what have you how did how did those athletes deal with a grand final loss or a big league loss how did they how did they handle that uh, I think it, it probably a bit different really so individuals will deal with things uh, differently and again in, that will depend on I guess what's uh, their I guess their reasoning thought process about maybe why they didn't win. So I guess as an example, if a player's made a few errors in the game, they they might find feel themselves you know guilty almost of of that sort of negative negative result. Um, I think I think overall, um, obviously, generally players don't really like losing, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think obviously to to strive to win and, and to be better is obviously a good a good attribute to have. But I, I guess it's how you I guess. I guess suddenly flip that working in a, like a team sport where you're playing every week I think it's a lot easier because you, you have very little time to to sort of um, mop around and feel sorry for yourself almost you, you sort of try and put that bad performance result to bed and then you, you're literally on with the next game so again in, in a rugby football environment it might be you know it could be three days late you're playing another game so you don't really have the time to time to do to sort of do that but at sort of any level really I think if you you are going to make mistakes you are going to things aren't going to go as well as, as what you want but I'm sure even in a bad a bad performance or a bad you know a bad result there's probably some positive things you can pick out of there and again there's things that you can probably pick out that you think I didn't do too well and then it's probably then what what to do about that if that's something then you can go and work on yeah. so maybe you were pretty poor in the last quarter of the game and that might relate to like fatigue or fitness so again that's something quite easy you could I guess work to fix up not necessarily in that day but over a sort of period of time it might be a certain like piece of skill or technique that again let you down a couple of times and again I don't know if you obviously football or design some drills or do some get some coaching on that particular facet of your game again that's obviously going to help so that the chances of that happening again are obviously like got to not not taken away completely but obviously they're going to going to be reduced I guess you, you've worked in obviously, like we keep saying, you've worked in this this elite level sport. You've worked at, um, or, or you've been part of the grassroots game and things like that. You've now got kids who are gonna, you know, maybe go into sport and so forth. Know, knowing what you know about it all, Andy, what what are the key attributes you feel as parents we should be promoting 
to our children, to give them the best possible chances of of going far in sport or, or indeed going on to do what you've done in, it might not be they make it as a pro, but they do, they work in a sport they love. What, what are the key things you'll be promoting in your kids? Uh, I think we've mentioned, mentioned a couple of probably main things like, and, and there's quite a lot of obviously evidence, this is not, not just in sport, but in, in all, a lot of different domains that ultimately for someone to be, I guess, successful, um, they, they have to probably enjoy what they're doing and have to, they have to want to want to do it. I think obviously as, as I guess as parents, obviously some kids obviously need a bit of pushing sometimes, otherwise they might just be sat on their iPad or doing whatever else they don't want them to do. But um but I think there's obviously a level there where where they they obviously need to want to do it themselves and it's that it's those probably kids who do that who are probably gonna I guess again it's you, you don't know, but are probably gonna potentially do do better than kids that don't. I guess a, there is a, a line again again that if you push them too too much, um, there'll be a bit of pushback. So Blake, who's my oldest, like um, if I went to him most days, do you want to go outside and kick a ball about it? He'd just say, no, I want to watch like um, Avengers Infinity War for the hundredth time, you know, and yeah. sit, in the, sit on the sofa and watch that. Whereas um, just by about some chance, I don't know if I knew I was talking to you guys, but he got up this morning, he came into our room, fully kitted up in all his football gear, so he's like an Argentina top on and his shorts and socks pulled up. Says oh, I want to be a footballer today. So then, again, uh, he, he's obviously he's only pretty young and four. But he come downstairs for brekkie while we're making breakfast. I just set like a couple of goals up and was kicking a football around. But he probably did some like quite good stuff there. But that was he he sort of led that I guess. Yeah. As they get a bit older, obviously they'll um, they'll probably lead more more of that stuff and sort of self and set stuff up and he'll play with his younger brother and what have you. But I think obviously enjoyment's massive and um, you know and whether that is. Um, parents making doing stuff with their kids that to, to make it more enjoyable and get involved or or taking them to to sessions to, to coaching where they they're in an environment that environments that are enjoyable and with other people and kids their own age and uh, and that sort of side of things and I think though the biggest thing um, probably was just that perseverance and like mm. we've probably touched on it a little bit in the last sort of question where things aren't going to go well at some times and just to sort of sort of stick with it and I think probably the the best example I can probably give of my own experiences as in sport, where I can remember being like started playing like rugby when I was six or something like that, and uh, wasn't wasn't particularly like good. I wasn't particularly good at any point in my career, but I remember kids being at like ten, eleven, twelve, who were like almost like these like gods of rugby. Like used to just take about ten players to tackle them and playing for all the all the county level stuff, and um, and then you got to like twelve, thirteen, and then they weren't quite as good. And then you got to 15, 16 and they weren't even playing anymore because everyone had sort of caught with them and overtaken them. And the, the player that was the best player in the world or you know, all these clubs were looking at him when he was 10 years old was not even playing sport anymore because he wasn't, wasn't that good. Um, so I think, and whether that's the kids a little bit smaller than other kids, whether they're just not, not skill-wise at that particular time, I just think, you know, it's, it's, it's a long time between being like five, six and 15. And obviously a lot can, a lot can happen. But I think if if they enjoy it and they want to keep doing it and I think if, if they persevere then they're obviously going to get going to get better at what they're doing and even if they obviously don't make it at the top level of football rugby which we know is, the chances of doing that are really small anyway um, whether they go on to play you know semi-professional or even amateur sport we, we've, we've obviously all done that as well and we you know you have some great friendships don't you and, and you have some great times whether you know whether or not you're you're getting paid to do the sport or actually paying, you know, paying your subs and what have you to actually play sport. So I think it's just a great, it's a great environment. And I think sports, you know, to watch, to play, to be involved with. So yeah, I'll definitely be pushing, pushing my kids just, to, just, just, just if, assuming that they want to do, you know, stay involved and be, and be, be involved in sport. I think Nick, you had a quick, and it, this probably leads on quite well, actually, when you're talking there about the, the smaller kids and things like that. I think Nick wanted to ask you a little bit about um, Rob Burrow, wasn't it, Nick? And how how he ended up being sort of top of his game. Yeah. 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 Again, going going down the, the the skill the skill side of things. I mean, rugby obviously um, it, when you watch it, it strength and, and and size seem seems quite important. But then you, you see your players like Burrow, and, and obviously it's not all about strength and power. So yeah, my interest is um, why, why what made Burrow different. Um, and, and I suppose the relationship between skill and strength, how 
how much of training time in young players in rugby is dedicated to developing strength and power or is it predominantly the skill work and then the size will come as, as you grow? So, so Rob, and again, Rob's, Rob spoke about this himself where when he was growing up, he's probably the prime example of what, what I was just talking about where he was really good at what he did. He was really quick. He was a good rugby player, even as a young kid, but he was getting told by clubs that he was too small, he'd never make it. Um, you hear this all the time, don't you, with, with certain players who, who are going to have really good careers and obviously his, his career has been absolutely fantastic. And, and again, Rob, Rob will tell you himself, he, he obviously knew he was smaller, not as big as other players, but he'd use that to his advantage. So he would, he would I guess, he'd look at other players who were bigger than him, maybe not as mobile as him, and then obviously just try and beat them with either skill or footwork and being a bit more be faster than them or elusive than them. So whereas, you know, if he ran straight at them, he'd probably be getting carried off on a, on a stretcher. And he, and he knew that himself and did quite, you know, got, got busted up quite a lot of times because he was, you know, I guess in stature, um, inferior to some of those guys and, and not as strong and came off the, on the wrong end of it a few times. But equally, probably more so, he, he made some of the players look silly by, you know, being quicker and more elusive and being able to use his other attributes that he had, I guess, to his, uh, his advantage, really. So... I guess there's always going to be, I guess, some attributes that, you know, you're not going to get any player that's, you know, top of the tree in every single, you know, facet of a, of a game. And he probably just maximised his, his attributes of speed and, you know, of his footwork and, and that, those sort of things, you know, to make up for maybe his other, other sort of um, ones he was lacking in. But in, in saying that, however, they, he was actually still pretty strong. So if you, you know, some other, some other guy, if you talked in terms of like pound for pound, yeah, you know, yeah, he was probably as strong, if not stronger, than most you know, players in the actual squad. Even though he was like five, five foot, five foot five, I think he was tall, which is you know, obviously well below the average height for a not in a certain, obviously for a, for a normal, you know, a normal bloke really, not not even a rugby player where they're all probably six foot plus. And um, I think it's it, fingers crossed. It certainly seems to be becoming uh, less prominent, but in football, talent identification you know stronger bigger faster players were getting picked up over potentially better players um it's something that you see in rugby as we know strength is so important in the game uh yeah i think so um rugby is a little bit different to football in terms of that cl- clubs can have like sort of an eye on players but they, they generally don't come into rugby unions a little bit earlier when they're sort of like 14 but rugby league like players don't come into a club till they're about 15 years old Whereas obviously football, you can get kids in at eight years old, can't you? In like you know, instructor sort of coaching, yeah, even younger, yeah, yeah. So um, it's obviously quite a lot. It's very different in that sort of uh, that sort of respect, really. But um, I guess, yeah, I think coaches now, and there's loads of data, and again, this is all in a lot of sports. Rugby's quite heavy in it as well. They'll they'll sort of know the the general attributes that a player at 17, 18, 20, probably needs to have as a as a baseline to to be in with a, a a good chance of making it if that makes sense mm-hmm. so again if there is going to be exceptions and again rob burrow will be an exception to probably that those sorts of rules but generally speaking if you know if they're not they don't think they probably get to that level in a couple of years or whatever it may be then they that might not be a player that they they pursue and, and ask to come into their their their, their sort of system uh, but obviously then that's that's the job of those coaches that are in that system. So when they do get players in and maybe they identify that they need to work on certain things, they obviously got then a window to, to obviously help them to, to guess to do that, to, to try and fulfill their potential and get them, you know, improved in the areas that they, they need to improve really. Um, yeah, the, the, the academy thing's quite interesting there. Cause that's, there's a, there's a little bit of um, change, <clears throat> although there was going to be some change coming to the football academy system, but I don't think it is now. Because they were talk of that, like the kids, the kids aren't being kids. They aren't, they aren't allowed to be kids. I think it has, as I say, has changed slightly. But that's interesting that rugby don't do that until until well into their teens, which is great because it gives them chance to play at a, a local level with their mates and enjoy it, enjoy that community feel. Because there is a massive community feel to rugby. Yeah. Um, you know, when, whenever I've been to a grassroots game, the amount of people there. It's all the families and they're all enjoying it. Very, very different to football in some ways in that regard. But it, yeah, that, that's an interesting thing. And there's a lot of research at the minute going into that about is our kids in academies from four, five, six, is that impacting their life ultimately when they are older? 
Um, and I think there was going to be change coming, but I don't, I don't think that's happening now. But you are seeing that some big clubs like Bayern Munich, we spoke recently on a couple of podcasts about that they've they've cancelled their academy to under 11s now, um, and I think there might be others that fall, end up following suit. So yeah, that's that's quite. I didn't realise that about rugby league. That's that's interesting. Um, Nick, have you got any more questions for for Andy before he leaves? Um, yeah, lots. I will. I will <laughs> pick one that I was interested. Not really on anything that we've been we've been talking about, but. Um, Static stretching, Andy, was something that was prominent uh, when I was growing up, uh, training and things like that. What What are the pros and cons? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of research here yeah, about about stretching and, and like with with most um, physical things, it probably the, the answer is got to give you a straight answer. It depends. So um, in terms of static stretching, what what it, the, probably the big change has been over the last like, 10, 15 years, particularly, is that. Um, try is is maybe trying to avoid static stretching, particularly pre-activity, because there's quite a lot of evidence now to suggest that it can actually reduce your ability to um, produce like force and power and actual. So again, if you were doing that as part of a say a warm up for a football session, for example, it might actually be a detriment not only to I guess um, physical performance, but your actual ability to do what you're going to in to do, like say a football game. Um, post activity is a little bit different where you're like, I guess cooling down if you like and um, relaxing tissues where it might be more more advantageous. So the timing of static stretching is obviously is quite important. What you'd be better doing pre um, activity is more like dynamic and movement based stuff, which again, which a lot of, I guess, coaches and that are probably aware of now. And that's why it's incorporated a lot into to like warm up type um, type drills. Any more, Nick? No, no, I'll leave, I'll leave them there. Unless you've got any uh, other myths to debunk, Candy, is there any, any <laughs> big things in the industry at the moment that people do that maybe doesn't have as much value as I think ice baths and things like that spring to mind? Is there anything that you think a lot of people do? Again, yeah, well, again, it's like it, ice is another, another a, a really good uh, topic and there's a lot of evidence like pro um, for it and, and against it. And again, a lot of it comes to do with the timing. So again... Um, like post injury, you know, that first maybe like 24 to 48 hours, ice is actually really good. One, it inhibits like reduces pain and also will help to like reduce inflammation and swelling and things like that. You never actually want to stop inflammation um, because the inflammation is actually the first part of the healing response. So that's why we, um, this is not actually, not, not actually well known, I don't really know why, uh, but like that's why you should avoid like things like anti inflammatories immediately post injury. Because you actually want to, you actually want something to become inflamed. You can, you, you don't want excessive inflammation. So if you can reduce the amount, an ankle is going to swell up or something like that. That's quite helpful because generally you can get moving and get doing things a bit quicker. But you don't want to like stop it, sort of stop it completely. And again with ice, so ice baths are uh, are, are okay again for same sort of things. But beyond that, probably forty hour window, they're only probably really like a pain mediator. So they only they help to reduce pain a little bit. But that's generally because they just cool the surface of the skin. So obviously, if something you don't feel it as much because it's cold, so it's not as painful. So again, you know, people who are routinely using ice, like you know, for an injury that they injured like a month ago, it's it's probably not doing quite as much as um, as what 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 they'd like really. Did you have challenges around that though? Where, for example, you you might know that the the impact isn't massive, but there's almost a placebo effect for the player or they, they really buy into it. Do you kind of have to manage that sometimes? Yeah, hundred percent. And, and particularly in like a in full-time like sports setting where there's, there's access to those things all the time. And, and again, yeah, it, it is a trade-off and it is very individual um, focused. Um, one of the things I've seen really uh, done really, really well at, at the FA with all the England teams. And this is like a, a sort of system that's used from the seniors all the way down to sort of the under 15s mm-hmm. is that they they promote uh, like options in terms of recovery. So it's not this is this is what the evidence says. This is the best recovery we're doing today. This is what you're all doing and making players almost do it. It's it's giving them some support and guidance, but almost saying right today you've got one of three options to do. You're either going to you know post session they might jump up in the gym and spin, spin the legs over on a bike for 20 minutes and do a bit of foam rolling. You know, one of them might be, you know, jump in the ice bath for 10 minutes um, at more, you know, the higher levels. It might be to jump on with one of the therapists for like a soft tissue massage type thing. And again, 
a lot of that as well because you're taking players from their club environments into an international environment where what they get at club might be one of those three things or might be something different. So you, you're almost trying to, I guess, cater to a certain degree what players like. And some of that is placebo. Some of the, you know, you can see players sometimes, he'd be, more, he'd be better if he went and did that, but he wants to do that. And it's a bit of a, a trade-off. And you can obviously try and educate players as to why they might be better doing certain things. But ultimately, it's going to be, I guess, to a certain point, it's going to be their, their sort of choice. Um, and if it obviously makes them feel better, that's, again, that's obviously really important when you're managing... Um, manager to play at, at any level, you know, amateur or, or professional. Might be uh, probably some good stories about players trying to con you into giving them the all clear to then get back out on the pitch and stuff when you know full well that uh, that, that ain't going to happen. To get out of training. Yeah, get yeah, out of training, yeah, yeah definitely, <laughs> definitely a few of them. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll maybe save them for part two. But um, Andy, can you... Um, can you t- firstly thank you for, for this because yeah. we know you're, you're a busy man even during even during lockdown you've got your online clinics and things um can you tell people more about where they can they can find some info out about you and your and your clinics uh yeah so if anyone's interested in anything i guess more physio related in terms of like getting into the industry or, or some of the stuff i'm doing um that would be probably go to newgradphysio.com that's my website there and then uh, my, my clinic we've got actually a couple of clinics one in manchester and one in leeds uh, and that's perform ready clinic. So if anyone's uh, unfortunate enough to be injured or, or struggling with anything, wants any like advice about anything like that, uh, just go to the website there. So that's performreadyclinic.com, uh, and all, obviously all the details and contact stuff is is up on there. Definitely recommend it. Anyone that's um, any any parent out there, any any coach that's got players that have got niggles and things like that, whether you're a child or adult, just it's not. It's sometimes just better to get that second opinion or professional opinion before you. You try to play through the pain or whatever. So uh, yeah, give uh, give Andy a shout. Andy, thanks so much for that. Um, we we'll hope to get you on again soon. And uh, yeah, and we'll talk to you later on. Oh, well, thanks for thanks for having me on, lads. See you soon. See you later. See you soon.